Today on Locked On Pac-12 Podcast, we're diving into more about Travis Dye transferring some possible commits eyeing Oregon in both men and women's basketball teams continue to rise. You are Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to another episode of Locked On Pac-12 Podcast. Uh, We are free and available on all platforms, so thank you so much for making this your first listen every day. Uh, Today's episode is actually brought to you by Sonos. Experience the game like never before with Sonos Arc, the premium premium smart soundbar for TV, movies, music, gaming, and more. Visit Sonos.com to learn more. I'm your host, Cindy Robinson, former Pac-12 student athlete. Joining me today is our Oregon expert from Locked On Ducks, Spencer McLaughlin. Spencer, a lot's been happening over there in Oregon. Uh, Obviously, we've been talking about Dan Lanning taking over in Eugene. And initially, it was how great he's doing coming in and retaining some of those athletes who were looking to transfer. But unfortunately, he was unable to hold on to one important key piece, and that is running back Travis Dye. Now, yesterday, I gave a brief discussion on my own about uh, Travis Dye transferring and what that means. But I definitely want to talk to you about it because I want to dive deeper into the Oregon aspect of it. I think I talked more about what he's adding to USC. And I kind of want to talk more about, like, how that's a loss for Oregon. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a busy time in, in duck country over the last last week or so, and that's not going to slow down anytime soon because basketball, which we'll get to later, is, is heating up on the men and the women's side. And, you know, football, National Signing Day is a couple weeks away, so lot, lots to get to. But, yeah, it, it's not surprising, I think, that players eventually, you know, started to, to leave in bigger numbers than we saw early earlier. Mm-hmm under the Dan Lanning administration as they start to started to come in. And, you know, I, I was really shocked, but surprised in a good way that they were able to keep so many guys on board, you know, Sean dollars and seven McGee and the offensive line. And that, I mean, those are big time retentions, Ty Thompson, the backup quarterback as well. Maybe the starter this year, who knows, we'll see when the spring game rolls around come, I believe it's in April, but Mm -hmm. Travis Dye, this is one that that definitely caught Duck fans off guard. And I am definitely in that group. I saw that his name was in the portal and I audibly said, whoa, what? Right. Like that. I'm sure. I'm sure some fans shed a tear or two. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it was, it was just surprising because he had such a great season and he played in the bowl game as well. You know, that's why a lot of people were surprised. Caleb Williams put his name in the portal because both those guys played in the Alamo bowl. And typically if you're going to leave the school, you might leave before that game. And I give a lot of props to both of those guys who, you know, eventually made what, what they feel is the right decision for them and putting their names in the portal and exploring their options. I give him a lot of props for playing in the Alamo Bowl because a lot of players are choosing not to do that if they yeah. don't have to, quote unquote. Right. But that that to me shows a level of commitment to not just the game of football, but to your teammates as well, that you wanted to finish what you started as best you could. And Oregon couldn't get it done in that game. But Travis Dye was exceptional, as we saw all throughout the season. And I think that the, uh, the, the stardom or popularity of Travis Dye, I think, has really kind of exploded in in the Oregon fan space over the last season whereas before people saw him as a good player and he's referred to as baby die of course his brother Troy yes. was mm-hmm. was a great linebacker at Oregon who yeah, you know, another also, brother too Tony die that went to UCLA yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. there there's a couple of them but the two that came through Oregon led to him being referred to as baby die and he, he was always a good player but then CJ Verdell went, went down late in the third quarter against Stanford and suddenly there was this question of, okay, we've seen Travis die. He's done a lot of good things. Can he be a number one back? And he definitively showed this past season that, yes, he can, leading the Pac-12 in all-purpose yards. And he was Oregon's right. leading receiver multiple weeks because of just how the offense ended up shaping out this year, which we don't have to get into. But it's a testament both to 
you know, some of the limitations Oregon showed a quarterback this year, but also to Travis Dye's tremendous talent and his ability to gain the trust of his quarterback, Anthony Brown, as a receiver and his ability to catch the ball out of the backfield. He is a tremendous, tremendous route runner. He's got that that great, almost kind of Christian McCaffrey light style of a, a jitterbug or that yeah. stutter step that he has when he comes out of the backfield. Number of times this year in the red zone, he was used brilliantly to – to run out and just go one-on-one with the linebacker. And he just comes up, gives a little stutter step and goes right around. And he's very good at that. And he's also just an effective runner. He's not the biggest. He's not the fastest. He's not the strongest. He's not the flashiest, but he's among the most effective running backs you will see. I mean, whatever Oregon needed at the running back position this year, he was able to provide. I mean, if you needed short yardage situation, yeah, he's only, you know, he's under six feet tall and, I think he's under 200 pounds as well. But every time we had to pick up a third, fourth and one or second and short, it seemed like he was able to pick it up. And he just he, he found a way. And that's kind of the hallmark of his game is he finds a way to to be effective and productive. The statistics back that up. And I think because of how important he was to the Oregon offense this past season, it's why a lot of Duck fans were surprised and a little sad to see him go. I think Oregon's running back room is going to be fine because there's a lot of talent behind him and the offensive line is really good. But USC has definitely gained a very talented and capable running back in Travis Dye. Well said. Um, Do you feel like, I mean, it's kind of hard to speculate, but is there any reason why you could think of like why he might have wanted to transfer? Well, I think it just kind of felt for him like the right time. This is entirely speculative. I don't have this right. sourced, but right. just my feeling is he committed to play for a Mario Cristobal led staff or originally Willie Taggart. I think I'd have to go back and, and look specifically, but he, yeah. he committed to play for that previous staff. And when you're somewhere for four years, that's not something you see a lot in, in college football, especially when, when you have a guy as talented as, as Travis Dye, who right. is definitely going to be thinking about the NFL as his running back mate for the last four seasons, C.J. Verdell announced that he's going to do, leaving the University of Oregon for the NFL draft. But, you know, he committed to play for that staff. Four years is a long time in the same place. And with Crystal Ball and company moving on and a brand new regime coming in, even though Travis Dye, you know, with Verdell leaving, could have been the undisputed number one back behind a really good offensive line. I think he might have just felt that it was time for a change. And he's going to a head coach in Lincoln Riley, who has produced a number of NFL caliber offensive skill guys, whether it be quarterback, running backs, or receivers as well, because he is a really sharp offensive mind. And though the USC roster, I think, still has some building to do to get to a level where they could win the way Oregon is capable of in 2022, they're not going to be a four-win team. I, I, I bet you USC wins seven or eight games in in 2022 really you don't see them as being okay uh, we, we, we can keep going on yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, 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 we'll, we'll carry it over yeah we can we, we we can always circle back to that but yeah. they'll definitely be improved under lincoln riley who has done nothing but win football games and score points as a head coach so the scoring yeah. opportunities are going to be plentiful i think the potential downsides for him going to usc are that austin jones a talented running back from stanford transferred to usc as well so he might have yeah. to split carries Whereas if he'd stayed at Oregon and Verdell had left, Die would have been the number one back. No question. That's fair. Yeah, that's yeah. fair. But fair and the other downside is USC's offensive line has been probably their weakest unit on that side mm-hmm. of the ball. So I, I don't know how much success he'll be able to have compared to what he did this past year at Oregon. I can't imagine he repeats, at least statistically, what he was yeah. able to do. But, you know, some guys just say, you know what? This feels like it's run its, run its course. It's time yeah. for a change to move on. And he, he goes to a, a really good offensive mind in Lincoln Riley. Yeah. All right. Well, coming up next, uh, Spencer and I will kind of comb through the options of athletes that are looking to possibly commit to Oregon. Because I know the fans are wondering who is Oregon going to replace Travis Dye with. Bet Online would like to wish you a happy new betting year as we continue our march to the playoffs and beyond. Bet Online remains the number one spot for all the best sports wagering action for 2022. New year in a new updated desktop and mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use the promo code LOCKED ON to get started. From football, basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC, 
right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for 2022. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports. Bet online is where the game starts. Thanks for making Locked On Pacto podcast your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. Okay, Spencer. So the news of, you know, all the running backs that Oregon is losing, CJ Verdell and Travis Dye. I know it stings for some of these fans, but on the upside, there are people, certain student athletes that are eyeing uh, transferring to Oregon. And like I said, I think, I don't know if it's maybe because I'm paying attention more this year or I don't know, but it just seems like there's been so much action within the transfer portal after this uh, last season, especially within the Pac-12 conference. And we've seen a lot of players bounce from one Pac-12 school to another. I wonder if that has a lot to do with maybe the, uh, the lift of not having to sit out a year. And then, you know, other players knowing what they've seen playing against those teams and probably realizing like they'd like to be a part of those teams. Uh, Jared Broussard was a big name going into the 2020 season, 2021 season uh, for Colorado. I'm not sure if he was as great for Colorado this season, but he's still a good, a good enough running back to keep your eye on. And so that was one of the names that was circulating over the weekend that he was in Eugene, Oregon. It wasn't uh, quite clear that he was for sure at Oregon, but we're going to make some educated guesses here that he was there checking out the school. And so I want to know what your thoughts are on Jarek Broussard possibly making his way to the Ducks. Oh, I think you're muted. Oh, whoops. I don't know. It's I don't okay. Know. It happens. I don't even know how that happened. Uh, <laughs> a, a capable running back in the Pac-12. He was the 2020 Pac-12 Offensive Player of the Year, mm-hmm. averaging over five yards a carry. And then he was right around the four yards per carry mark. I think he might even have even been under that this past season for Colorado. So he's a guy who's looking for a change in Oregon without Travis Dye and C.J. Verdell. Clearly now has a need at the running back position. And right. I think that th- this is just – it, it just fits. There, everything about this seems to fit perfectly because who wouldn't want to go to a team that not only has probably the best offensive line in the conference coming back for for the Ducks, but also a right. team that expects to compete at a high level. And he's looking for a new environment, and Oregon needs someone who's proven that they can be a, a dependable running back in the Pac-12 conference, and Jarek Broussard is certainly that. And I don't think Oregon fans should take too much from the fact that his numbers fell off from uh, 2020 to 2021 because he was playing on a Colorado team that just struggled to do a lot of things this mm-hmm. year. And, you know, no matter what the r- exact reason was, he is going to play behind a better offensive line if he comes to Oregon in, in 2022. I and mean, that's probably going to be Oregon's biggest strength this season. It was – a year ago and everyone except for one starter is going to come back. And the good news on that front is that Oregon last year regularly, whether by design or just by, you know, guys getting banged up regularly would play six to seven offensive linemen in a game. You don't see that very often, but because this offensive line room is so deep and talented, they are able to rotate guys in and out. They've moved positions a lot and they've just, I mean, the previous staff did a really really good job with that, which you would expect from Mario Cristobal, former offensive lineman and offensive line coach. That's, you know, his identity. And he is excellent at at coaching that position And Oregon is going to be able to reap the benefits of that for 2022, even now that Cristobal is down at Miami. So I I think Broussard is a player who Oregon should be looking at. He makes a lot of sense. And I think he'll be able to, to succeed in that running back room with Byron Cardwell and Sean Dollars getting carries as well. Where would you say is like Oregon's biggest concern in me besides the running back? Because we know the situation right now, what's happening there. But like what other positions are like a little bit of a major importance going into this offseason? Free safety is the biggest Mm -hmm. one. I think when you look at the projected starters right now for Oregon football come uh, that opener against Georgia, which is a 
rude awakening for right. Dan Lanning as a, as a head coach, getting to right. go up against the reigning national champs down in Atlanta in a neutral site game. I will uh, say this, though. The only ad it's advantage of that is that he's pretty aware of what they're working with. Things will change, I'm sure, yep. in the offseason, but he's coming from that program. So it's a little it's a little bit of an advantage on his end. Yeah, I, I agree. He'll know the players and know the scheme and, and what to look out for, and that, that mm -hmm. definitely helps. But it's still going to be a, a hostile environment and a tough yes. way to start the season. But, yes. you know, quarterback is a question mark at the moment. Dan Lanning has been adamant that it's a quarterback competition between Jay Butterfield, Ty Thompson, and Bo Nix in no particular order. In yeah. fact, it's probably the reverse order of, of what I just said. Right. Bo Nix one, Ty Thompson two, Jay Butterfield <laughs> number three. But you never know. They're going to take a look in – spring practice and, and in camp and look to see who they want the starter to be. My guess is it will be Bo Nix, but right now free safety has got the biggest void uh, along with defensive end. You know, the linebacking position is really, really talented for Oregon. They're fine there. Corner was a need, but they added uh, a guy in Christian Gonzalez also from Colorado who was a three-star recruit, but rates as a four-star transfer he should slide into a, a slide or a starting defensive back spot as a reigning Pac-12 honorable mention guy. Dante Manning and Triquez Bridges and Jalen Davies probably make up some combination of the other corner and the nickel corner as well with Bennett Williams back. He's a nickel guy who's effective. Jeffrey Boss will be at strong safety, but I don't know who's going to play free safety right now for the Ducks. It's just sort of up in the air. And yeah. the the other need is defensive end. They They added... Taki Taimani from Washington to help shore up the interior of the defensive line with Popo Almave and Brandon Dorless, who were back, the two highest rated defensive linemen in the conference last year. But defensive end was just anchored by Kayvon Thibodeau last season. And when Thibodeau wasn't on the field, there was no pass rush, particularly at the defensive end spot. So I think that those are the areas where Oregon has to be able to look to, to, to fill holes come, come 2022 or they have to be able to majorly develop guys who have been waiting in the wings because they're losing a couple of first-team All-Americans at, at those two spots. Thibodeau on the defensive end position, and then on the back end, Verone McKinley had an outstanding mm. year. He's going to the NFL. I think he projects as a really good player. He's got tremendous range and, and phenomenal instincts that, that he trusts as well. And th those, are, those are two big losses on the defensive side. Wide receiver might be a place where they look. There's a lot of young yeah. talent, but there's also a lack of veteran presence. So I think a guy like Chase Coda from UCLA, who's played four years of college football and whose dad played at Oregon, he grew up in uh, Medford, Oregon, went to South Medford High School. I think that's a guy who makes a lot of sense as well. But, you know, I, I would look at defensive end and free safety before wide receiver, but I would take a, I would take a glance at all three. All right, well... It's still time. It's still early. Like you said, uh, signing day is coming yep. up. So hopefully there's some excitement there surrounding the Ducks in the Pac-12, obviously. Uh, but coming up next, we're going to take things to the court and start talking men and women's basketball because they are currently on the rise. Hey, Pac-12 fans, this is Cindy with an incredible app everyone who buys gas needs to know about. Get Upside. My listeners are earning cash back for every gallon of gas every time they fill up. Just download the free Get Upside app in the App Store or Google Play right now. Use the promo code SCORE for $0.25 cents per gallon or more on your first fill up. Cash back. Don't pay full price at the pump anymore. Get cash back using Get Upside. Just download the app for free and use the promo code SCORE for $0.25 cents per gallon or more on your first tank. Some people who drive a lot are making as much as two to $300 a year in cash back, and there's no catch. The cash back gets added right to your account. You can cash out at any time to your bank account, PayPal, or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Just download the free Get Upside app and use the promo code SCORE to get $0.25 cents per gallon or more cash back on your first tank. That's promo code SCORE. Okay, Spencer, last time we talked, we were getting excited for the matchup that was literally happening that day. Uh, Oregon women were taking on UConn. And later that day, we were texting each other like, 
They did it. They won. Oh, my God. Huge, huge win for not only Oregon, but the Pac-12 as well. Um, UConn is just one of those teams that no matter who is on the team, they're always talented. Uh, it was a big blow that they're missing Paige Bukers, but still a very talented team, still a huge win for Oregon women. And then it seems like the men and both the women continue on this win streak. They both recently had uh, matches against – Washington, you dub the other Washington, the one I don't, we don't talk about too much. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, and took down the Huskies. The women's game was a little closer. The men's game, complete blowout. And so at this point, what do you see for the future of Oregon basketball? Are they going to continue on this rise as they get ready to face some tougher teams? Or is it just a fluke? <laughs> Well, first of all, I'm glad that your saltiness from your four years spent in Pullman hasn't hasn't left you. That's never, never. That's that's the sort that's the sort of energy that that make college sports so so fantastic. But I, I think that both teams are starting to come into their own. The women have cracked the top twenty five, coming in at number nineteen. It is it is huge, 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 huge that that Sobley's knee injury did not prove to be significant because. Mm. She was in there late in that UConn game at a time when you could have argued she didn't really need to be. It was a 20-point game with like three minutes to go. But, you know, I I tend to defend coaches in that spot because you don't want to be the team that blows a 20-point lead in three minutes. You know, I remember uh, one March Madness game years ago, Texas A&M was going to get upset. They were down like 11 with 30 seconds left. They came back and won. You know, you, you just 99% of the time you're going to win, but you don't want to be part of the 1% of teams that – that has that lead get away from you and then stays with you forever. So right. that, that was a huge win for the women. Then they got a nice win on the road up in Seattle against the Huskies. And then uh, meanwhile at home, the men, uh, I'm trying to think of how to put it politely. Uh, they smacked Washington at, at home mm-hmm. in, in a significant way. It was one of the uh, bigger conference game blowouts that I've seen in uh, in, in a little bit of time because it was 44 to 10 at one point. Washington in the first half had 13 points and 14 turnovers, which is an astonishing stat and a testament number one to the fact that it was clearly not the Huskies day. And number two, that Dana Altman has finally got his team that has a lot of transfers and guys who hadn't played together before starting to mesh together at the defensive end. And coming into this year, People had high expectations for Oregon, and so did I, because I saw who they got in the transfer portal. Guys like Davion Harmon and Jacob Young and Quincy Garrier, they are athletic, talented, experienced players. And so I expected them to be able to play at a high level, and then they weren't just not winning those games early in the season. They were getting blown out. And now they're starting to beat teams that way in in the other direction, which is good. And I I think that their athleticism and size at, at the defensive end and their tenacity, the way they get after it, I think is really, really tremendous. And the, the emergence of Nafali Dante and Frank Kepnong down low as the shot blockers we're used to seeing with Oregon men's basketball, I think is really, really important. And th- their ability to interchange those two and not really have a drop off and mm-hmm. just always have that big presence inside his big body blocking shots, dunking the ball at the other end. Will Richardson is shooting the ball lights out. If he keeps shooting the ball the way he has been en route to a couple Pac-12 Player of the Week honors, then there's no reason Oregon can't be a a very dangerous team come tournament time. I 100% agree. Now, the women have cracked the top 25. They're sitting at number 19. The men, not quite yet, but I feel like it's right there on the brink, right? Um, I don't think that it was a fluke that they swept in the LA schools and both of those schools are still in the top 25. I think if they continue on this path, continue to rise, continue to, you know, beat these teams, we're going to see them crack the top 25 and right in time for March Madness. <laughs> yeah. And the, the biggest thing with that is right now they're receiving the seventh most votes votes for a team, not in the top 25. So okay. they're unofficially, you know, the, the number 32 yeah, essentially yeah, yeah. Is, is where they are at. And what matters at the end of the day is that you get into the tournament. That that's all that you know. With Oregon's start to the season, the the goal is just get into the tournament. And right. once you're there, literally anything can happen. I mean, a seven seed has won 
the national championship before. I'm pretty sure an eight seed. I'm pretty sure Kentucky won as an eight seed before. Eleven seeds have made the final four. So <laughs> you just have to get in, and literally anything could happen as long as you're playing your best basketball. And that's what is so so great about about March Madness is you just you you never you never know. And I I do believe it probably won't be this year because we just had a team uh, that was seeded double digits get to the final four. But one day a double digit seed will win the national championship. There's my bold I, prediction of the day. I and am not I'm not going to disagree with you because I, do. I I don't I don't see how you I mean if if a double digit seed can get to the final four the way UCLA did and play a game that comes down to an almost half court buzzer beater against the number one overall seed in the tournament Gonzaga. T- tell me why that team last year in UCLA couldn't have won the national championship, why they couldn't have had a chance. And look, I'm not telling you it's going to happen this year. I'm not telling right. you it's going to happen in the next five years. But at some point, a 16 seed knocked off a one. It took a little while, but the fact is the beauty of this tournament is you just have to get in. And right. if Oregon, I think they can shore up a an at-large bid into the tournament if they can end the regular season with fewer than 10 losses. If they go into it with with nine or fewer losses, they're at six right now and they're on a six-game winning streak. If they go into it with, with eight or nine losses, they're 100% in. But even if they get to the, the 10 or 11 loss mark, I think those quad one wins, as they're called, you know, road wins against top five opponents who were ranked in that in that space at the time, I think that'll be enough to be able to get them there. But, you know, there it's easy to pay attention to the top 25. And, you know, we mentioned that with the women, which is important because that means that if they continue to play good basketball, they're going to be in the tournament as well. And you just got to get there. But I think for the men, just just get into the tournament, win the games you are supposed to. And I think that will be enough because Oregon's got pedigree. They've got the resume building wins with two top five road wins in USC and UCLA back to back. If they're able to beat Arizona somehow, then that, that, that would almost solidify it because that's too many wins. But they've got to continue to win games as we record this. They've got Colorado tonight. Mm-hmm. And if they if they can beat them and beat Oregon State, it'll it'll put them in an eight game winning streak. But you know, every, every coach will always tell you, take it one game at a time, right? And then, and then and then move on to the next. But if Oregon keeps playing the way they have, especially at home, then I, I don't think they'll have a problem be, becoming a tournament team. Yeah, they have some time before they'll face Arizona. I don't know if I think there was a game that they had to reset a re, uh, reschedule, and I don't think that's been done yet. So. We'll be looking to hear about when that's going to happen, but yeah, that I Arizona. I was going to look to see when that when that Arizona game was. I think it's it is. not. It's not till February nineteenth, but I don't know when the rescheduled one is. So uh, we it looks like see. they've just got Arizona on the schedule once, and it's at it's at Arizona and Tucson. So that's that's tough. But they've also got UCLA again, and they've got USC again at home. So yeah. You know, I don't think you can expect to win every single one of those games, but if you if you win a couple, right, you already beat both the LA teams on on the road. I think if you can if you can go two and one in those games at Arizona, at home against USC and UCLA, I think you go two and one there and then have no more than two or three losses elsewhere, I think right. they'll be okay to get to get an at large bid. I agree. Okay. It's it's honestly college basketball's heating up, Pac 12 basketball's heating up already seeing some March Madness moments in January. And that is why we love college basketball. So thank you so much, Spencer, for joining us per usual. One of our favorites on here, always bringing the great insight for Oregon. Uh, Make sure you guys check out Spencer on Locked on Ducks Monday through Friday on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcast. He's giving you everything you need to know about the Ducks. You hear the, you hear the info. He has it for you. <laughs> Got to check out his show. Always prepping. Always, 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 always working. Every, every little uh, story or tidbit of information I see anywhere, it's just all, it's all information that gets bungled up in my head, and then I just get it to you out on the show somehow in a controlled and informative manner. We appreciate it very much. We definitely do. You guys also can follow along on uh, Twitter at Locked on Ducks and then at Smalls underscore 55 for Spencer's personal handle. Make sure you guys check out Locked on Pac-12 podcast on YouTube. 
and the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcast. And then follow along on Twitter at LO underscore pack 12. And thank you so much for making this your first listen of the day. Now go ahead and make sure you go check out Locked on Bets and make it your second listen of the day. Uh, there's Lee Sterling and, you know, all the great info you need to know about betting. You can get it right there on Locked on Bets. Other than that, continue to stay locked on Pac-12 on the Locked on Network.